So, Dr. Schleicher, is the U.S. standing still while other countries are surpassing it in educational attainment? You can certainly say that in <coughs> high school uh, completion and also college completion that uh, the world has changed very significantly and uh, many countries have expanded their education systems much faster than the United States. So while the United States has progressed in relative terms, relative to other countries, it's fallen behind. And why is that? Simply because other countries have uh, invested more in getting more people to complete better qualifications. Uh, you can also see that when you look at the quality of learning outcomes, when you actually test students in key subject areas like math, science or reading, that the United States performs at best around the average level. And when you say invest more, are you speaking simply about how much money they've put into their educational systems? Or are you talking about something else? Actually, the volume of money spent on education only accounts for about 20% of the performance variation that we observe in the industrialized world. How you spend those resources is a much better predictor. How you get the best qualified teachers into the most challenging schools, the most talented principals into the most difficult areas, that's what a country like or a system like Shanghai in China demonstrates is possible. And where does the U.S. stand on that indicator, its, its uh, ability or its will or its progress in getting the most uh, qualified and talented teachers and principals into the highest disadvantaged schools? Well, overall, the, the impact which social background has on learning outcomes is higher in the United States than in most high-performing education systems. It's not that the United States has a greater degree of poverty, child poverty or disadvantage, but it's simply that disadvantage translates more directly into this uh, sort of lower performance levels. And Now, the question on how in part it is related to the allocation of resources. The United States is one of only four countries which spend more money into in schools that are in more privileged areas, whereas in most education systems now one can say, at least in terms of the quantity of resources, more investments is made in areas and schools and teachers and students that uh, have greater need for improvement. So how concerned do you think the U.S. educators and policymakers should be about the social and economic stratification and of its test scores and of its academic achievement and what do you think they should do in terms of uh, reallocating these disparities? Well, first of all, the impact of social background on learning outcomes is a sign of the inefficiency of an education system. It's basically the kind of lost talent pool that a country has. If your success doesn't depend on your true cognitive potential, but on the opportunities you get, then basically society loses a lot of potential. And one of the things that we observe is that even though inequalities have not risen dramatically in schooling outcomes, the consequences of inequality for the life chances of students have dramatically changed. Basically, at the high end of the spectrum, those who have advanced qualifications had never before the kind of life chances they have today. And at the same time, those who struggle with education at the beginning, who don't get a high school degree or no college degree, actually see rapidly declining life prospects. So there's reason for concern, but I also think there's good news. I think one of the most inspiring findings from the PISA 2009 assessment has been that some countries have been able to dramatically close the achievement gap. You, know, you can see that in Poland, you can see that in Germany, you can see that in a number of countries in Brazil, where countries have been able to actually to moderate the impact. Well, a lot of people say that the, the culture of a country contributes a lot to its uh, attitudes and policies towards education. And as you say, the U.S. is one of only four countries that distributes resources in what would appear to be a counterproductive me method, which is to give the more privileged more resources rather than the reverse. What does it take for a country to make the, that kind of quote-unquote reverse investment? Uh, that the, and why do you think the U.S. so far has been unwilling to recognize that and change its policies. Yeah, I don't deny that culture is important, but you need to ask yourself the question, is culture inherited, static, or is it created by what public policy is doing? And actually, when you look at the successes of Finland in the 1960s, an average performer, now one of the most best performing, most equitable education systems. If you look at the same picture in China, in Korea, in Ontario, in Canada, 
Those education systems haven't changed their culture. They haven't changed their teachers. They have changed what they do in the education systems. And I, Canada is a great example. They had very similar f school financing than in the United States. And they've been able to actually change the school financing to basically ensure that the resources are invested where they can make more of a difference. It's a tough thing to do, but there are great examples for education systems very successful with this. Germany, another case. And if Canada, I guess which people would, most people in the U.S. are aware of Canada, it has also, I guess, has a federal system as the United States does. Um, how, what did it take, and this is an audience of people who write about education for the general public, so what kind of um, shift in thinking occurred and how did that occur and what would you advise people who write about education to focus on as they uh, try to contribute to this debate? If you look to Canada, one of the provinces with the most fascinating improvement is probably Ontario and it started with leadership actually. You had a premier who made that a priority who basically decided that education should have a higher value than other things and who convinced school leaders and, and, and teachers that that was the right thing to do. Uh, that's sort of, sort of difficult to quantify, but I think that's certainly been a very important factor. Who set very clear goals, who set uh, measurable goals, and who invested in the profession. I think the big change occurred in the province of, Ont province of Ontario when the system moved away from the kind of old Tayloristic factory-like approach where someone develops a curriculum and then lots of teachers teach that curriculum towards a professional approach where teachers basically were put into the front line and they were not only the recipients of wisdom from the government but they were contributors to this. If you look for example the, the <coughs> teacher for excellence, every school has a teacher that is who is responsible for success, you know, to address those kinds of excuses that schools often have and they can't de deal with difficult or challenging students. So there's been a sort of an investment in the profession that has really changed the way in which the education systems work.